he who had always commanded great armies, who had never maneuvered but to meet the enemy, who in every battle had been accustomed to decide the fate of a capital or a kingdom, and who had his heir to been accustomed to commence and conclude a war in one campaign, saw that he must henceforth assume the character of partisan leader, an adventurer, roaming from province to province, skirmishing and destroying without the hope of advancing any decisive success. The horrors of civil war also helped to darken the picture which was exhibited to him in the most unfavorable light, but it is vain to attempt to describe this interval of painful anxiety and hesitation. Suffice it to say that those who represented to Napoleon the possible chances of a civil war had most influence in inducing him to form his resolution. Well, since I must renounce the hope of defending France, cried Napoleon, does not Italy offer a retreat worthy of me? Will you follow me once more across the Alps? This proposal was received in profound silence. If at this moment Napoleon had quitted his saloon and entered the hall of the secondary officers, he would have found a host of young men eager to follow wheresoever he might lead them, but a step further, and he would have been greeted at the foot of the stairs by the acclamations of his troops. Napoleon, however, swayed by the habits of his reign. He thought success could not attend him if he marched without the great officers whom his imperial dignity had created. He conceived that General Bonaparte himself could not renew his career without his old train of lieutenants. But they had received his summons in silence. He found himself compelled to yield to their apathy, though not without addressing to them these prophetic words. You wish for repose. Take it then. Alas, you will not know how many troubles and dangers will await you. On your beds of down, a few years of that peace which you are about to purchase so dearly will cut off more of you than the most sanguinary war would have done. Napoleon declared himself to have been subdued less by his enemies than by the defection of his friends. And taking up his pen, he drew up the second formula of his abdication in the following terms. The Allied powers having proclaimed that the emperor is the only obstacle to the reestablishment of the peace of Europe, the emperor, faithful to his oath, renounces for himself and his heirs the thrones of France and Italy and declares that there is no sacrifice, not even that of life, which he is not ready to make for the interests of France. Chapter 5. Treaty of the 11th of April. The Allies could hardly have presumed the hope that Napoleon would be induced to make so absolute a sacrifice. The Duke de Vicenza presented to them the act of abdication signed by Napoleon and hostilities were instantly suspended. Nothing now could interrupt the negotiations. The Allied sovereigns from the first moment declared that Napoleon should retain the rank, title, and honors belonging to crowned heads. A promise had been made to assign him an independent residence. There was no obstacle to the execution of these designs. In the choice of a residence, the sovereigns at first wavered between Corfu, Corsica, or the island of Elba. But they decided in favor of the last. With regard to pecuniary matters, the Allies manifested a desire to treat Napoleon and his family with the greatest generosity. They even anticipated what Napoleon's negotiators conceived they ought to demand. An establishment in Italy was assigned to the Empress Maria Louise and her son. Incomes were granted to all the members of the imperial family. Neither the Empress Josephine nor Prince Eugène, Napoleon's adopted son, was forgotten. The more liberal these promises were, the more they appeared to gratify the vanity of the allied princes. The Emperor Alexander even carried his generosity so far as to take into consideration the few aides de camp, generals, and servants composing Napoleon's military suite and domestic establishment. He proposed that Napoleon should, as though he had been on his deathbed, dictate a will to remunerate them. While the treaty which was to ratify these arrangements was preparing in Paris, Napoleon dispatched courier after courier to demand from the Duke de Vicenza the return of the paper which contained his surrender 
of the throne. Napoleon had been dissatisfied with himself ever since he signed the act of abdication. The diplomatic negotiation which ensued displeased him. He thought it both degrading and useless. After surviving his greatness, he wished henceforth to live as a private individual, and he was mortified to reflect that the great sacrifice that had been made for the peace of the world should be mingled with pecuniary arrangements. Of what use is a treaty, said he, since they will not settle the interests of France with me. If only my personal interests are concerned, there is no need of a treaty. I am conquered. I yield to the fate of arms. All I ask is that I may not be accounted a prisoner of war. And for that, a mere cartel is sufficient. Napoleon, having thus simply defined the situation in which he was to stand, it was easy to foresee the fresh difficulties that would impede the ratification of the act which the plenipotentiaries had taken so much pains to frame. The treaty was signed at Paris on the 11th of April, and the Duke de Vicenza carried it immediately to Fontainebleau. But the first words Napoleon uttered were a demand for the return of the act of abdication which he had given to the Duke. It was no longer in the power of the Duke de Vicenza to return the paper. Matters had now gone too far. The act of abdication serving as the basis of negotiation had been the first document presented to the Allies. It had even been made public. And had been inserted in the journals. Besides the allies, the plenipotentiaries themselves, and most of the servants of the imperial government regarded this transaction as embracing something more than the personal interests of Napoleon, great importance, was generally attached to the fact of the abdication, because that was to be the basis of of a new order of things which was preparing in France, and the Allies thought that the Bourbons could not pay too dearly for the formal renunciation of the preceding dynasty. It is remarkable, however, that the Emperor Napoleon and the Bourbon family viewed this renunciation with equal displeasure and united in affirming that the act was unnecessary either for the former in descending from the throne or the latter in ascending to it. Napoleon in vain rejected the treaty. Fontainebleau was now a prison. Every road leading to it was carefully guarded by foreign troops. To sign the treaty appeared to be Napoleon's only means of preserving his liberty, perhaps even his life, for the emissaries of the provisional government were lying in wait for him in the gov in his own neighborhood. The day ended, however, and Napoleon still persisted in his refusal. How did he hope to escape the extremity which threatened him? For several days past, he had apparently been occupied with some secret design. He became dull, and his mind was only occasionally roused by the contemplation of the gloomy pictures of history. The subject of his private conversation was the voluntary death to which the heroes of antiquity had doomed themselves in situations similar to his own, and he coolly quoted and discussed different examples and opinions on the subject. The apprehensions which this turn of mind were naturally calculated to inspire were increased by the following circumstances. The empress had quitted Blois for the purpose of joining Napoleon, she had arrived at Orléans and was expected at Fontainebleau, but Napoleon himself stated that orders had been issued to prevent her from carrying her design into execution. He feared that his this interview might induce him to relinquish his meditated design. On the night of the 12th, the silence which reigned in the long corridors of the palace was suddenly interrupted by the sound of hurried footsteps. The servants of the palace were heard running to and fro. Candles were lighted in the inner apartment, and the valets de chambre were called up. Dr. Yvonne and Grand Marshal Bertrand were also summoned. The Dukes de Vicenza was sent for, and a message was dispatched to the Dukes de Bassano, who resided at the Chancellery. All these individuals arrived and were successively introduced into the Emperor's bedchamber. Curiosity in vain lent an anxious ear. Nothing was heard but groans and sobs escaping from the antechamber, and resounding through the gallery at length, Dr. Yvonne came out of the chamber. He hastily descended into the courtyard, where finding a horse fastened to the railing, he mounted him and galloped off. The secret of this night has always been involved in profound obscurity. The following story has, however, been related. During the retreat from Moscow, Napoleon had, in case of accident, taken means to prevent his falling 
alive into the hands of the enemy. He procured from Surgeon Ivan a bag of opium, which he wore hung around his neck as long as danger was to be apprehended. He afterwards carefully deposited this bag in a secret drawer of his cabinet. On the night of the 12th, he thought the moment had arrived for availing himself of this last expedient. The valet de chambre, who slept in the adjoining room, the door of which was half open, heard Napoleon empty something into a glass of water, which he drank, and then returned to bed. Pain soon extorted from him an acknowledgment of his approaching end. He then sent for the most confidential persons in his service. Ivan was sent for also, but learning what had occurred and hearing Napoleon complain that the poison was not sufficiently quick in its effect, he lost all self-possession and hastily fled from Fontainebleau. It is added that Napoleon fell into a long sleep and that after copious perspiration, every alarming symptom disappeared. The dose was either insufficient in quantity or time had mitigated the power of the poison. It is said that Napoleon, astonished at the failure of his attempt, after some moments reflection, exclaimed, God has ordained it that I shall live. And yielding to the will of providence, which had preserved his existence, he resigned himself to a new destiny. The whole affair was hushed in secrecy, and on the morning of the 13th, Napoleon arose and dressed himself as usual. His objection to ratify the treaty was now at an end, and he signed it without further hesitation.